We have today uh, Dr. Dale Stevens. Um, I've actually known Dale for a really long time. Dale was a PhD student at Carleton University uh, doing uh, research on rat brains. And uh, I was still doing my MRI thing back then, so we did a little collaboration back then. And I've known Dale ever since. Um, since those uh, younger years, Dale has moved on to bigger and greater things. He's now the director of the uh, Cognition and Aging Neuroscience and Neurointervention Lab at York University. So the, that's the CANN lab, so I'm assuming that if you get hired there, you can't. You, you can. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, uh, um, so but what I haven't actually followed what Dale's been up to, but uh, so it sounds like it's going to be really cool what he's talk about, because instead of just looking at the brain and saying, oh, this is interesting, they're actually trying to like mock with it and change it and get getting feedback on the imaging. So anyway, with no further ado, uh, Dr. Dale Stevens. Thanks, Greg. Mainly, mainly because he stuck to uh, a pretty team script kind of read the introduction. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we worked, we worked a lot of long hours uh, uh, doing doing imaging experiments like in days out here, but it was a lot of fun. <laughs> Good to see you. Thank you. Start by saying thanks um, for, for inviting me and, um, and everybody who I got to meet with today. It's already been a great day. I had some um, good meetings. Uh, and um, got to see the facility, which is pretty incredible. It's a really cool scanner. Um, so it's great. Um, I'm happy to be here. I also um, have histories in Ottawa. I lived in Ottawa for nine years. That was a long time ago, about 19 years ago. Um, I had a very long circuitous sort route of through undergrad and, and grad school and part time playing a band here. But I've been back in a long time, so it's pretty cool to be back. Um, all right, so I'll jump in with the talk today. Um, I'll try not to go too far over, I guess we're at four times. It's okay. So, reversing age related cognitive decline, combining network based neuroimaging, non invasive brain stimulation, and neurofeedback training. And so, that, the title, I thought it was kind of, kind of a bold title that might draw people. Of course, then it's hard to deliver on that. And can we actually reverse age related uh, cognitive decline? <clears throat> well, I'm not going to, I'll tell you, I'll foreshadow right now and say, I'm not sure, I don't think so, just yet, but I think we've got some promising results. Um, so I'll just start with where I'm going to go today, so just my roadmap. Um, I'm going to start with a little bit about what we think we know. Um, and when I started doing human work, which was when I started my PhD at the University of Toronto, actually, I was a master's student at Carleton. Oh, um, So I, I, after, after Carleton, I went to the University of Toronto, and I did a PhD there in uh, human neuroimaging and neuropsychology. Um, and and that, that, that was a while ago now, and so I think that over the years we've been studying um, age-related neural cognitive decline. Um, and although we have some sort of simple models, I think we've come a long way, and we have some things that have replicated, and that seem to seem to explain some phenomena. Um, and part of that has to do with really focusing on a network perspective of looking at the brain, which may sound obvious, especially to people here. But I'm going to say a little bit about that. Um, but then I'm going to say a little bit about what we don't know. And I'll foreshadow again by saying most of my talk today is going to be about things I don't know that much about, and I'll say what I mean. Um, basically, that you know, we have some models of aging, um, we, have, we have a good idea of what we think is going on, um, but it's a correlational technique when we're looking at neuroimaging um, for the most part. And um, as Greg sort of mentioned, uh, what I've been trying to do since I got to York University, a little about five and a half years ago, is combine some of what we've learned network based neuroimaging with non invasive brain stimulation and some other techniques where we're actually trying to experimentally modulate brain um, activity on the network level to actually have an experimental causal sort of impact. One, to test some of these models and find out if we know what we're talking about and things are the way we think they are. But also, hopefully, um, towards development, development of neural intervention strategies. Okay? Um, so, from what we think we know to what we definitely don't know or don't think we know. So, what we're going to do about it is try and find out. So when we talk about modulating brain networks, a little bit about the non-invasive brain stimulation and neurofeedback chain, and the development of neurodimensional strategies. And so when I said that I'm talking a lot about what I don't know, these two areas, the non-invasive brain stimulation and neurofeedback chain, um, are completely new directions for me in general in my lab. So I'm doing something uh, today that I don't usually do, and that's presenting data that's really new, stuff that's just coming out, and that I'm still learning about in my lab is just, just getting into. So this is really new stuff. This is not long, well-established things. But I will go back and talk a little bit about some of the things that are, we think are long and well-established from our work with what we think we know. And do feel free to stop me with questions and clarification. Okay. Okay, so um, I'll start by why am I talking about a network-based approach. Um, 
Because I think that um, from early on, uh, in both um, non-abusive brain stimulation, and I'll be talking exclusively today about TMS, or transcranial magnetic stimulation, um, and even in, in neuroimaging, in particular with MRI, um, from its start, and even up until today, I think there's, there's been a, a beginning where it was a lot more about localization and much more of a modular perspective. So a lot of what was happening was, um, with TMS, for example, is trying to have very targeted um, disruptions or uh, enhancement of activity in very circumscribed brain regions um, at very, very fine millisecond level time, which is an incredibly powerful tool. Um, and I think that one way to sort of um, to characterize this, and people talk about it like this, whether it's appropriate or not, is this idea of a virtual lesion method, right? Where if you can sort of isolate or localize a particular part of the cortex that's near the surface that you can get at with TMS and have an effect on, um, you have fairly focused kind of stimulation uh, and very fast timing. And you can really get an idea, people sort of argue this is, it gives you some information about the causal role of that brain region. So if you sort of knock the brain region out and it alters cognition in some way or you can't perform some kind of task, you can demonstrate a causal you know, relevance of that brain region. Okay? So just a little cartoon class example here, somebody's using a, a coil on the from the visual region of the occipital cortex, while somebody's looking at a screen with letters. Simple task, go in, present with letters, and just has to name the letters. And depending on when that TMS pulse hits the primary visual cortex, you can have an effect on performance. So here we can see at time zero, this would be when um, the letter came on the screen. Okay? And then you have the time at which this person hit the button and get a very quick pulse and disrupt the activity in the primary visual cortex. So we're going up to 100 milliseconds after, 180 milliseconds, and some milliseconds before. What you see is, gives you an idea of how long it takes for that information to get from the screen, you know, through the retina, through the optic tract, and optic nerve, um, back to the primary, primary um, visual region. So it's somewhere in here around 80 to 110 milliseconds, right? So this, what we have here is performance, you know, letter, letter recognition accuracy here, and the time at which stimulation happens. And so performance plummets. To pretty low. And this is obviously an easy task, and, and this uh, participant is sealing the rest of the time. You'll notice there's a little blip here that is actually before the letter came on the screen, and that has to do with the effects probably of an intentional or blinking. So if you stimulate someone ahead and you get a blink, they might miss the letter on the screen. But the idea here is that um, you know, it's a powerful tool for targeted um, investigation, and you can move along you know, different streams and determine timing when things are happening. Um, but it's really focused on sort of the, the function of a particular patch of cortex. So I think it's from a very modular view. I think some of this comes from where cognitive neuroscience as a field came from, and that is neuropsychology, where lesion patients are still kind of the gold standard. You've got a patient with a very circumscribed damage in a picture, particular anatomical or functional region, and you get some idea of the cause of all of that region. And I think that that's where we started with neurostimulation. And I would also say with neuroimaging. So there's, as you can see, an MRI scanner, like the one we have. Um, and here's one example. Um, not to, not to, well, I am singling this one out, but not to criticize it, but there has been a lot of attention on uh, functional localization. Now, I don't, and I don't have a problem with that. A lot of the work I do, we do functional localization because it's important um, to find you know, regions that are functioning when you think they're doing. This is an example of someone who, um, a researcher from MIT, is Rebecca Sachs group, who argued that this part of the temporal parietal junction, or the TPJ, as they call it, is very specifically evolved for theory of mind. Right? So theory of mind is the uniquely human, arguably uniquely human, ability to um, understand or infer the thoughts or motivations of others, right? or to understand another's mind. Um, highly, I mean, we're talking about sort of a very highly evolved, very high level cognitive function. And this is sort of, I would say, a hard modular kind of view here, that this patch of cortex has, has evolved um, specifically for that kind of purpose. And they do argue, I mean, I don't think that's a strong man, that's the argument. Again, a very, very modular, localist kind of view. Okay, so and this has led to, you know, this idea of what people often level that MRI calling as modern phrenologists. Um, and this has come more probably from the hardcore cognitive scientists who aren't interested in the brain for the most part. But I, I've heard, had this level before. So obviously, we all remember phrenology is from Psych 101, I hope. This is uh, Franz Joseph Gall. The idea that you could learn all kinds of character characteristics, personalities, um, skills, qualities, and things from the bumps on the head, right? And they worked out this huge, obviously, pseudoscience or non-science, but empirical ability with calipers and measures and bumps and things. 
and a map of the brain where the bumps in the skull can tell you all kinds of things about the mind. So that was chronology, and of course it was discredited, it doesn't actually work. Um, but I think people, I've heard, you know, this modern day functional MRI being referred to as modern chronology, where it's take an old experiment, we know what's happening, or something we know about cognition, stick it in the scanner and see what lights up. Or I've heard it called blobology. Right? So, am I in trouble here? Am I just a modern chronologist? <laughs> <laughs> so we're not doing, I'm going to try and say we're not doing modern technology, and we're trying to move beyond that, beyond modern technology, and really, I think we all know that the brain is a network, it seems obvious, we have billions of neurons with, you know, orders of magnitude, billions more connections, we know it's a network, but for a, for a long time, I would say, for the most part, in neuroimaging and even neurostimulation, we haven't treated the brain that way. So that's what we're trying to do. And so I'm going to talk today a little bit about large-scale brain networks. So what we're looking at here, and hopefully people have gotten to be somewhat familiar with the idea of um, intrinsic functional networks, or resting state functional connectivity. Um, I can talk a little bit about it, usually it's a whole talk, but and that's the idea that um, we know a lot about um, groups of brain regions that configure together um, in dynamic networks to perform different kinds of cognitive tasks. Okay? Um, what we also now know is that there's a whole lot of spontaneous, seemingly random fluctuations of neural activity in the brain all the time. Neurons are never just sitting there quiet or off, right? They're always firing. In fact, when you look at a sort of a, an aggregate systems level, there are groups of brain regions that tend to ebb and flow, or you know, wax and wane in terms of their activity. Um, and so for the most part, the first 10 years or more of functional MRI, that's always considered to be just a random noise that we have to statistically get away from our tiny little signal associated with you know, whatever event we're giving your task or, or, or stimulus. When you actually look at those spontaneous fluctuating, well in this case is bold signal, which are very low frequency. It can be on the order of 10 seconds to a minute kind of fluctuations up and down. But that, those, those time courses, if somebody is, say, lying in a scanner with no particular external task, just lying there with their eyes closed or staring at a blind screen, you find that those spontaneous fluctuations are highly correlated and coherent across distributed brain regions that are parts of functional networks. So people now are using this to sort of parse the the brain. I think early on they thought it was a good proxy for doing anatomical mapping in the living human brain. Um, we now know that there's a whole lot more going on than just reflecting um, white matter neural anatomical connections. But that's a talk for a whole bunch of different days. I just want to make sure that Rob is feeling the idea that I'll be talking both about task evoked activity, but also these, um, what I'm calling resting state functional connectivity, um, it's, which is really just correlated spontaneous activity across brain networks. And so here's an example of you know, um, several different networks um, by one partition technique. So they all come together on the brain like you know, a 3D puzzle or a continents on an atlas. Um, I'm not going to get too deep into the, the whole network story. Today I'm just going to focus on three particular networks. Okay? So starting with this, what we call uh, the dorsal tension network, the default network, and the control network, often referred to as the frontal parietal control network. So it's kind of a, it's a, kind of a simple model. We ran in our lab with my collaborators at, at MNI and and Carnell and other people at York have referred to it as the three net, a three network model. And none of this is to suggest we think the brain is as simple as three big large scale networks. But we think there's, at that systems level, there's some really interesting things going on that pertain in particular to cognitive aging. Okay, so really quickly, we're talking about the, um, the default network and the dorsal attention network. Okay? So the default network would be here in blue, and the dorsal attention network would be in red. And it's just a quick poll. Is anybody not familiar with or never heard of the default network or not really know what it's about? Just correct. Okay. That's no, right. So we got to a point where you know you can hardly pick up a journal that has neuroimaging in it without somebody looking at something about the default network and what it has to do with a particular disorder or condition or, or individual difference. Um, nevertheless, these are thought to be these anti-correlated networks, right? Where even during a you know given task, when somebody's doing something outwardly focused. We have a dorsal attention system that's on that we think is probably responsible for focusing on the external world. What we see is a common suppression of default network regions. That's why they call it default. On the other hand, when people are doing a seemingly unconstrained task, this is how it's discovered, you actually see an increase in activity in these default network regions and a suppression of activity. Well, people realize that these things are highly correlated, negatively correlated. When one's up, the other is down, and vice versa. Now, that, that happens not only during tasks, when people are doing things, but also in terms of the random spontaneous neural fluctuations. So when one network is really engaged and the activity is high, the other one is low, and vice versa. And they tend to ebb and flow, even on these long, slow timescales. 
So that's sort of a, you know, this, I mean, there's a paper about this being sort of a fundamental property of, you know, systems level brain organization. You've got this yin yang two systems that are on and off anticorrelated. We'll see a little more about that after. There's one third network I want to introduce, and that's the, the front of parietal control network, control network here in green. And the idea here is that this is, you know, from lots of years of cognitive studies and, and functional and task related studies, a lot of these regions are critical for a higher level task anytime you're doing anything cognitively effortful um, that requires executive demand um, or any kind of goal oriented task. We see an increase in these control regions. So I'm going to talk a little bit about how I think these three networks interact and how they might be critical uh, in cognition. Okay? So back to the idea of the integral network. So this is first this is uh, from, a, from a review paper by Fox and, and Fox and colleagues in KNS. Um, and again, just arguing that um, you've got these, you know, these anticorrelated systems, yin yang, um, when one's on and the other's off. And how this was initially discovered was from pet work, um, pet studies, how's the transmission tomography. I believe that it was out of the lab at Washington University. And uh, first by a guy named um, I should say, they noticed that you know, there's always a reference to scan of some kind of rest scan to which you compare your active states. And they noticed that um, it didn't seem to matter what task someone was doing or they were comparing to the rest scan, there seemed to be these regions of the brain that were more active during the rest than in all kinds of other tasks, whether it was you know, doing math problems or reading or looking at pictures or doing different kinds of things. And so you know, when, when, the task is, when the task is engaged, the, the brain region's dorsal tension system or maybe the control system would come on, and the default network region would suppress you and quiet. When you left people to their own devices, unconstrained, mind wandering, or when the brain is off, which you know it never is, but we think it is off if we're not giving somebody a task and you're a psychologist, um, these regions become more active. And so they actually refer to them as um, task positive and task negative networks. And it's had a huge impact, and people still to this day, I can find an, an, an issue in the journal today probably that came out where they people still call them task positive and task negative. Maybe, maybe you do. What we, of course, know is that the default network is not task negative at all. It's not just for sort of um, unfocused, unconstrained thought or, or mind wandering. It has been associated with mind wandering. Um, pretty, pretty soon after they discovered the default network, people started to realize that it was specifically active in all kinds of tasks. So things like autobiographical memory, they also realized that it seems to be engaged or activated when people are imagining the future or planning, doing goal-oriented planning. It becomes highly active. So this is a lot of work coming out of um, a lab that right in my postdoc at Harvard, Dan Schachter and John Addis, um, where they argued that it was, they called it the mental time travel network. And the idea was that maybe the default network is critical for passing memory, but, you know, recalling memories and then using that memory knowledge to read the mind to plan for the future. Okay. Um, other people like Randy Buckner and others came along and said, well, it's not just for, you know, memory and, and imagining the future, even theory of mind tasks where you're, again, imagining, trying to imagine or infer the thoughts of others activates this brain, this, this set of regions, the default network. Um, even moral reasoning tasks tend to activate. Right? So he could, they call it a self-projection network, anytime you're sort of away from the here and now. Right? Then they realize that you don't even have to be projecting away from the here and now. If you just have people lying on an MRI scanner, and try to imagine a scene. Say you're lying on a beach, describe it in as much detail as you can. You're talking about the sand and the warmth and the sound of the waves, and you get a, you get a strong activation of this brain region. So they call it, it's really the mind's eye scene construction network. So, uh, you know, at the time that I was at Harvard, I worked with my close uh, friend and colleague, Nathan Sprang. We, we were thinking, you know, what it is, people were still calling it a task negative network. And it seemed to us, people were starting to realize, I think, that it plays some kind of a fundamental critical role. It's a huge, it's a huge swath of, you know, area of the brain. It's all this blue regions here. It seems to be active for all kinds of tasks, but we don't really know what it is. And our idea was that the common factor of all these things is something more fundamental. And that's the idea that they all involve some sort of introspection. So focus on the internal mental milieu. So whether that's a drawing on your memories, or imagining your memories in the future, or thinking about, you know, imagining a situation where you're doing moral reasoning, or trying to infer the thoughts of others. Um, and that, well, what we know is that when you do, people used to say a task positive, when you, anytime you do something a task in, in, a, in a scanner, you get an activation of these task positive regions, so the dorsal tension system. But it's actually only the case that that comes back when you're externally focused. And it just so happens that most of the research involves looking at stimuli, lights, shapes, sounds, pictures, and making responses, right? So our idea was that 
what is probably the most, if you step back and think, what most fundamentally does the human brain do? Well, it helps us survive and get around in the world and stay alive. What does that involve? Well, it involves, you know, for humans especially, conscious awareness of our memories. It means drawing on what we've learned, um, what we know, our knowledge and our memories, but constantly using that to guide us in the environment. So an example, if, I, if I'm finished my talk and I'm ready to leave and try and find my way back to um, an office, um, obviously I have to get up and immediately activate a mental map of where I'm going. But as I'm walking through the room, I have to pay attention if there's somebody in the way or a table, open the door. Really, it's a constant toggling between our knowledge and referencing what our current plans and goals are and what's happening in the world around us. And so focus is constantly toggling outward and inward, possibly simultaneously at that time. And our idea is that the default network and there's more to it because it has to do with the structures it involves. It involves part of the medial temporal lobe, the hippocampus, and things like that. But that is really all about that internal focus. And the dorsal tension system is about external focus. Right? So introspection versus or extrospection. So we designed, this is actually a credit to Nathan Spring this, he designed a uh, behavioral task to try and test this. So this is a classic Tower of London task, which hopefully some of you are familiar with, or Tower of Hanoi. Um, it's actually probably was one of the most commonly used test for looking at frontal lobe patients, assess executive disorders like planning. And so the idea here is that you have, you know, you have, you see a goal state. Often this is with an actual apparatus in front of a person or a patient. But you can do it in a computerized way. So you have a goal state, you've got these colored discs on these, on these uh, poles. And the idea is that how many moves would it take to get those discs in that configuration with a couple of rules. You can only remove and replace one at a time. You can't stack them higher than the poles. You can't move more than one at a time. Anybody want to take a quick guess on the moves? The fewest moves to do that? Greg, how do you go? <laughs> so you start at the top and you want to get to the bottom. Yep. Okay. You only have 15 seconds in the scanner. Really? Seven. Who got four? Somebody said four. Okay, what did you do? Um, I'm taking the, the crystal and red one. Yep. Yeah. Red and blue. Green over. Then the red in the middle, and then the blue. Excellent. So there's four. That's the best you can do. You can do it in more moves than that, obviously. So what we have are a series of these puzzles, right? So the idea here is that, um, I mean, it, 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 is, it is demanding. That's a four-move puzzle. But if you get all the way up to, to six or seven moves, it gets very difficult. So this it's executive. It involves working memory. You're holding lots of things in mind. You're manipulating information. But critically, so it, it's, it's focus, it's, it's a visual spatial task, right? You're focused on something, you're focused on a visual spatial relationship. Now, I mean, again, this is often used to look at planning and executive function deficits. It's very much unlike real world planning, when you think about it. So what Nathan did is something kind of radical. Um, he came up with what he called the autobiographical power of planning. That's autobiographical planning. So first of all, if you want to have the, the perceptual experience of what's flashing on the screen somewhat similar to so you on the compound there and brain activity differences. But rather than actually visually manipulate anything, you actually have to think about real life goals. So he had dozens of Harvard undergraduate students come in and say, what are your goals? What do you actually think about you know, when you're lying there at night or planning your future? And they came up with a lot of different things. He, he picked a bunch that were common dogs for all the people who came in. And he had them say, OK, your goal is, say, for example, freedom from debt. What are, some, what are some steps along the way and what are some obstacles? So freedom from debt is the goal. Um, if you get a good job, save money, and an obstacle would be half fun. So he came up with a whole bunch of these things. What people had to do is this display would come up, and then they had the same amount of time, 15 or was it, I think it was 15 seconds, to actually engage in playing that, really think in a, in a true way about how you're going to do this. You know? uh, if it's get married or you know, find, find a partner or graduate or finish my dissertation, things like that. And so, rather than vision, so in a, in a sense, it, it, it was, it's, it's demanding, it's, it's more real life like. It, 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 is, um, it is goal directed mental activity. It's got a similar visual display, but it's completely internally focused. Um, so, then of course, we had to have a low level control task. The idea would be that, you know, if both of these things are equally demanding and, and, and demanding of executive functions and they're goal oriented, then they should, they should drive sort of cognitive control regions of this chronic prior control network. More than something simple and low level like valve So in this case, it was just count the number of valves in the discs. And answer. In this situation, they're asked how much detail there was in their plan. Okay, so what I'm going to show you is really compelling. If 
might be the best result I'll ever get. And so I, I was on a high number 2010. I don't know if I'll get data like this again. But it only really is that compelling if you look these networks a lot and you can spot them right away. So when I look at that, I say, wow, there's the default network in the dorsal pension system. I know the dorsal pension because it looks kind of like a jack o' lantern. <laughs> but I mean, you know, the, the default system is a lot of mid midline things, medial prefrontal cortex and posterior cingulate or just And you've got, importantly, this lateral, if you're a private lobule, and some lateral temporal. So this is not uh, this is not just sort of amplitude. What we're doing here is something called PLS, partially squares. It's a multivariate technique. Rather than looking at treating box, doing mass universe statistics on lots of little box arbitrary size voxels and looking for amplitude, which is also still a useful technique. What this does is it's somewhat akin to a factor analysis or a PCA, and it extracts patterns of covariance across boxes. So all these regions in blue here um, took up a lot of the variance in the activity that was associated with the task of doing mental, like auto back up plan. So what we're seeing here, when this is down and this is up, so the blue regions were highly covariate together, really coherently, when people were doing the autobiographical plan test. Right? But the red regions, which are the dorsal tension system, all covariate together and became very active when people were doing that visuospatial tower alignment test. So we've really we've really got that anti-correlation here, right? But we're showing that you can actually drive the system in a focused goal-directed task. It's just internal focus. And this actually just shows the time course of that or the or the TCRs are 2.5 seconds times nine. So it's about 20 seconds. And of course that's all that's relative to this to the battle task that the counting task drives the external the dorsal tension system a little bit because you are looking at something. So this is what we call the first latent variable, or basically the first principal component that accounted for most of the variance in the data. But there's another highly significant pattern that also accounted for a lot of variance, and it was this, which is looks to be exactly like the frontal parietal control network. Right? What we found is that this thing became highly active and covariate in a, in a coherent way for both of the planning tasks relative to the low-level non-planning tasks. They didn't seem to care whether you were externally focused or internally focused, but you cannot. Okay, hope well, that makes sense. So that's sort of the three network idea. I'm going to talk a lot about that going forward. Okay, so th that was task-driven. Again, whole brain covariant patterns of activity. So now we're going to talk about, you know, are these things actually the networks we think they are? So we're looking at that and saying, oh, well, that looks like a default network, right? But one of the ways that people define these, they said these aren't just regions that become active together depending on the task you're doing. These are some sort of coherent, intrinsic networks, intrinsic functional networks in the brain. And the way they look at that often is by taking a seed box on the brain that we know is sort of the heart of the medial prefrontal cortex. And saying, if I look at the random time course of fluctuations of activity over 10 minutes and scan around somebody's lying there with their eyes closed, where else in the brain do I see that activity is correlated? And it will draw up the whole default number. So we did that. This is not new. This is actually a, a, a direct replication of a, of a study that was out recently before that. It was actually a study by an undergrad named Justin Vincent. So this is the default number. What we did is we put a little seed region here in the prefrontal pre pre cortex, looked at those random fluctuations, and said, show me where in the brain you've got significant correlations with that in random activity. And it's the default number. You have the same thing for the dorsal mesh network and the frontal parietal control network. So the paper I'm referring to is by the student Justin Vincent was he sort of discovered this frontal parietal control network. That's going to be important. So are those the networks that we saw activated in our task? Okay, well here I'm showing you just these same images, right? So these are lateral and medial views of the brain. Here I've got a weird view, and we only did that because we wanted to show it exactly the way it was in the paper that we were replicating. This is looking at the left lateral hemisphere kind of from behind and tilt it up. Right? So here's posterior and anterior, and that's the time a little there. Does that make sense? So that's what the resting state networks look like. And if you look at the figure from the original paper, it's an exact replication. Here's what our task data looked like in that same configuration. And so um, this is our autobiographical planning task, drove this, this, this set of regions, our visual spatial task, the top one and this, both tasks equally drove this network. So I think that's compelling evidence that these are one of these, these are the networks we're talking about here. Hopefully what you notice too is that these things are pretty much mutually exclusive spatially. They don't overlap. And it looks like if you put them together, they would fit together like puzzle pieces, right? And in fact, they do. That's what it looks like when you put them together. Okay? And so in the original paper, something we commented on is that and, you know, we're talking about these red and blue regions, the dorsal tension default, because it's anti-correlation. Anywhere you see a pair of these, it looks like there's a green blob between them. It's kind of a motif you see around the brain. Like 
control region. You see it here, you see it here, you see it in medial regions as well. And so in the initial, this is, this is just a resting state or intrinsic network. People speculated this thing might be uniquely well it's sort of, um, you know, interposed between these other two systems that are anticorrelated. And we know it's a control system from functional work. This is probably sitting there because it, it, is, it is sort of a, where our volitional control of our focus comes from. Right? This network might be the thing that points your direction, your, the focus of your direction out of the world or into your internal thoughts and memories and back and forth by engaging these two networks in an alternating way. So kind of a kind of you know, radical the idea. Um, and this, this is sort of circumstantial evidence. So what we then did was we said, okay, let's look at each of these resting state networks and just look at straight up bold signal. You know, how much do we activate the, the brain regions within that network? So if the default network is defined by rest during the task, you can see it was highly active and it was suppressed during the visual spatial task. Right? It's more of the same. There's a the dorsal tension system, highly active during the external focus visual spatial task and suppressed during autobiographical planning. And then this control network, right? Highly active for both tasks. So it looks like that along here. So this is nice circumstantial evidence, right? The control network's on, you do something demanding, and it's accompanied by activity, either the default or dorsal tension, depending on whether your focus is in or out. But we wanted to make some, uh, uh, we wanted to make a bolder claim and say that this frontal part of the control network actually flexibly couples with, or sort of pairs with, either the default network when you're doing internally directed cognition, and then maybe disengages and engages with the dorsal tension system when you're looking out. And that's actually exactly what we found. So by today's standards for a network sort of functional connectivity kind of analysis is very primitive. These are sort of whole network ROIs. We just looked at the average time course and activity in that whole network during these planning tasks regionally. And this is a terrible graph, this is old, but what we're showing here is how strongly connected one of these networks is with the control network, right, along here. So if we look at the default network, it's highly coupled with the control network during this loop task, which is the internally focused for autobiographical. But it's totally disengaged when you're doing power on that external focus task. Of course, if you look at the dorsal tension system, it's an exact crossover. It's highly engaged in the control network when you're focused outward and disengaged when you're focused in. So that was a measure of functional content. So our sort of simple three network model is, you know, fundamentally it's about managing the external and internal environments to reach to, to meet your goals and get around the world to survive. We do that with the frontal product control network. And just to show, I uh, think it's really cool, we actually attached this paper to these movies that you can download online. And this is going to show you sort of in, in real time what it looks like. So here's the visual spatial planning task. And over here you're going to see, okay, so here's the control and dorsal tension networks in time. So you see control regions are coming on first. Now you've got the dorsal tension regions coming on. And the yellow regions are where they converge. You're going to see that over time it peaks, you know, about 15 seconds into this trial, people are really focusing. Right, so the green is the control, the red is the dorsal tension, and those things are coupled, and the, and the yellow zones are where you really get convergence. You see the same thing over here for the control of the default network. If you watch that, this is some kind of phenomenon. Where first you can start to see the control networks come online, and the default regions, and the light blue regions is where the overlap is. So that was my attempt to say that I'm beyond, we're beyond modern phrenology. I don't know. <laughs> okay, I want to take one little step further than that and talk about actual network measures. So now people are, are you know, primarily driven by a lot of swarms, are recording really cool uh, network-based analyses in their engine. Um, things like graph analysis, things that network analyses that have been used in social sciences and all kinds of other fields for a long time, now applying the brain. So here we're actually just showing um, the default network, or as mentioned, the front private control that we that we now had replicated over about this is over about four different studies, so a lot of individuals. Rather than representing them just as activation across the brain, we can identify the core nodes in each of these clusters. So they all have sort of a core node. And then what is it, what is a network? Well, a network simply can be defined by a bunch of unit functional units, or nodes in this case, with some kind of a relationship or connection. And so what we talk about as a connection between them is the correlation in their spontaneous activity, because we know that has some functional relevance. So basically, we've got a bunch of little spheres here. The green ones are the front and right control network nodes, the blue are the default, as usual, and the red are the dorsal tension system. So I'm going to show you a sprint embedded graph. If you haven't seen one of these, I'll give you my analogy of what it is. You plucked all these little spheres off the brain, which are all intermingled all over the place. And you said, okay, each one of these is a, is a highly magnetic metal little ball. 
Or if you drop them, they would scatter as far away from each other as they could in the room. But now you're going you're to attach a spring between every pair of those little balls. And the strength of that spring that pulls them together is actually weighted by their, their functional conductivity strength at rest, which is a correlation of activity, spontaneous activity. And so if you grab all those balls together and they have springs between them and throw them up like this, they do that. And so you'll see that all the blue nodes here, which are part of the default network, cluster together over here into a community, as far away as possible from the dorsal connection system. And you've got the control, you've got the yeah, firm browser control system in the middle here. Okay. It's pretty cool. But there's a whole lot of other cool stuff to get out of the graph analysis. All kinds of metrics, like the size of these things represents something called between the centrality. Between the centrality is a measure of how critical that node is in communication across the whole network. So it tends to represent connector nodes. And it gets really interesting to start saying, well, what are those connector nodes? Front of right control network. Well, the left and right medial front, middle frontal jumps, which we've known for a long time, is, is really critical in these kind of common control tests. These, these tend to have equal strengths, not only to their own community, but to both their selection and the default. So I'm going to just quickly foreshadow. We think this kind of techniques, if you can individually localize these things in people's brains, and a lot of them are on the cortical surface, we can now start to do um, modulation or, or uh, modulate the activity in these regions um, using something like CMS. If you know some of the node properties, we have an idea of how it might affect the rest of the network. So what I'm going towards is what we're trying to do when we're doing non-invasive brain stimulation and modulating brain activity, we're trying to modulate things on a whole network level rather than really trying to narrow in on the function of a particular patch of brains. So that's what we think we know. The rest of the talk is about what we don't know and what we're going to do about it. So as I mentioned, the idea that um, functional MRI is kind of correlational. I'm going to talk a little bit about neurocognitive aging. So these are some things that we know, but we don't know why, and that's why we're up here. So here's a really great picture of the classic one that if you're going to aging, Tom Thales put out to make it really kind of impressed. Really influential review by Denise Park colleagues. Every one of these lines is a different task that a bunch of people were tested on, cross-sectional across from their 20s to their 80s. And we grouped them into speed processing, working memory, long-term memory, short-term memory. And that's what looks these, these are presumably typically typical healthy aging adults. There's it should be screened for dementia or any mild cognitive impairment or signs of it. It's a pretty nice steady decline across all those domains in typical health aging. But it's not the whole story. This is this other little one here. Knowledge based or verbal ability. So verbal intelligence, basically semantic knowledge. There's no reason to suspect that, that should decline over the lifespan. In fact, it can improve, it can increase and improve indefinitely, or at least be sustained. Any little downtick here, people suspect it's probably because at this age you're getting some uh, early mild cognitive impairment people into the group. Um, but that's an interesting fact. That's the, the stark idea. And this is this idea that how do we, how do we most be best characterize typical healthy cognitive aging? Well, the shift is declining fluid cognition, which is flexibility, novelty, new associations, but a preserved or consistently improving crystallized cognition. So you just indefinitely build up knowledge of the world, right? People often refer to it as verbal because. Obviously, verbal is highly correlated with their semantic knowledge. So that's interesting, but why? Why is that? That's a, a question of huge debate. There are different positions, but we don't have an answer yet. Here's an example of where the how that plays out. So this is I'm showing you um, some you know very often replicated result from something called the autobiographical interview. Pretty simple task. This version this was designed by Brian Levine, the Robin Research Institute. Simply, you have people come in and you ask them, you either give them a keyword or just ask them to recall the memory or something to show them a picture. And you say, I, you know, I want you to recall in memory a specific episode from a particular time and place, say, within the last five years. And you, might, you might have a list that says birthday party, wedding, you know, bris, whatever. And what they do then is, they, once they say, okay, I've got one, you know, now you say, I want you to recap that memory as much detail as you can. Just tell me the actual sight, sound, smells. There's a whole, there's a very, very well-established sort of rubric and set of guidelines. What we're trying to get people to do is give episodic details of memory. Right? So try to remember as much as they can. They have like three minutes to do this. Okay. So what, what happens is after that, you, you, know, you collect a bunch of these memories, and then you have them transcribed, and then you have three independent raters score these things or parse them. And there's lots of different things you can do to break up the content of those memories. But the most fundamental one is the distinction between internal and external detail. Now, some people say that basically kind of maps onto episodic 
memory or information and semantic. That's not completely true. Um, what it means is that you know, the internal detail are things that are actually specific part of the actual event or memory that we're counting, and the external is anything else. So you know, if you have someone says, I was at a wedding, um, I was really hot, I remember I could feel beads of sweat running down my face, and then I heard somebody scream because the you know, maid of honor passed out. Where somebody else might say, when I went to a wedding, it was really hot, I remember, because that July, that was the hottest July on record. Nixon was present at the time. Those are external detail, right? They might be relevant as context, but that's an example of semantic information. So these things are scored, and they have to be reliable. And this has been shown a bunch of times. I'm showing you results from a particular study done by a student named Brendan Gaser and Dan Shack as well. I'll tell you why. Here's the typical memory effect. Okay? The blue is younger adults, and the red is older adults. You'll find that in terms of internal detail, younger adults produce more internal detail than in older adults, more episodic information. The interesting thing is that older adults they produce maybe less information overall, but they produce relatively higher amount of this external detail than younger adults. So that's the classic characteristic shift. And if you think that what makes up a lot of this external detail is kind of contextual, semantic knowledge, kind of and generic knowledge that's surrounding the event, that goes along with this idea of this shift towards more, um, more, more crystallized cognition than fluid cognition. But the interesting thing was, and the reason they ran this, I'm showing you their order, was that rather than, and, and, Chapter one to test this idea that, well, it's not just, you know, it's mental time travel. It's not just about memories in the past. It should also apply to planning or thinking of the future, imagining the future. Right? So they have an imagine the future condition. And sure enough, you get the same thing. Younger adults have more internal detail, older adults have more external detail. Past and future. They submitted this for publication, and one of the reviews said, well, but maybe it's just a narrative style thing. Older adults, you know, they've learned a lot more, they have knowledge, they're storytellers. They, you know, it's not that they necessarily can't remember these things, it's that they're filling in the context, you know? It's why you have elders and, you know, things like that. So they tested that. They thought, they had what they thought would be the perfect sort of control condition. So they said, okay, what we're going to use, they first they replicated the imagination. So this is the first study where they actually just did imagination. This stuff had been shown before. Now they're going to do something called a picture description test. So for the, for all these conditions, they actually showed somebody a picture, and this was supposed to be human memory. So it'd be a bunch of people dancing at an event, and somebody say, oh, wait. And then they would recount the memory of web. In this condition, they're supposed to look at the picture and describe literally only what was in the picture. No extrapolating, no surrounding information, just describe it, right? There's a red dress, there are 15 people, etc. Here's what they found. Younger adults produce more relevant perceptual internal detail of the picture than older adults. The older adults are still giving more external experience detail. Now, I think that Dan was. Shock, shock, shock when he saw this. It actually accounted for most of the difference. They did a hierarchical regression, and there was still a remaining effect that was specific to memory and imagining over and above the description, but most of the variance was taken by that. So what is that telling us? One idea was used to be that, well, in memory, in older adults, it's that their episodic memory is declining, the medial temporal lobes are particularly susceptible, control regions they can't recall the detail. So what they're doing is they're filling the spaces, right? they're filling up the time with other details and things that they do know. Well, that doesn't really account for why this would happen, right? Another, one other completely different theory of what neurocognitive or cognitive aging is all about is that as you get older, it's an inability to filter out distraction, filter out relevant information. William Hasher and others in some of my PhD work showed that, right? So it could, could it be that? It's that they're supposed to be focusing on the picture, but they can't suppress that external. The picture is evoking other thoughts and memories and knowledge, and they just can't suppress it to stay on task. These are very, these are competing theories. Um, about what's going on at a fundamental level with aging, right? And again, they replicated the effect of the picture description task. All right, so what could explain this in the brain? Well, one thing we know is the default network seems to be particularly susceptible to age related cognitive decline. Okay? So, this is a paper writing about it. There's the default network in rest. That shows you the distribution of amyloid deposition in Alzheimer's disease, where you see the most uh, gray matter cortical atrophy and the most metabolic destruction. And just said, look, it's all looks like the default, right? There's also a considerable amount of evidence from just sort of cognitive neuroscience, task-based studies. There's a sort of LPM brain when somebody's doing an externally focused task. You've got the control and attention regions activated, but the default network regions suppressed. Here's what um, older adults and, and adults with Alzheimer's, probably Alzheimer's, look like. They have very little suppression of the default network. So is there something that's specifically broken about the default network in aging? 
possible. So Nathan Strain made another study. Um, it's a, a lot more to this than a very abstract version. There's a classic young brain looking at um, these networks. We've got the anti-correlation, right? So in this case, the red and the warm regions are the default network. We had a seed in the medial prefrontal cortex and said, where do we have correlated activity in the brain? And sure enough, you see the default network. You have a negative correlation with the dorsal tension system. Well, the older adults look similar. But as you can tell, that, you know, the brights are less bright and the blues are less blue. If you actually do a subtraction here and say, where's the difference? Now, this map, this is the young brain. You know, this is a huge group. This is about 75 older adults and um, 72 younger adults, I think. So the regions in red here where the older adults show an increase in correlation with the medial prefrontal cortex. Right? So there's a seed here in the medial prefrontal cortex. They had increasing correlations relative to the young all over the dorsal retention system. What they also showed is that if you take a seed in the default network, the rest of the default network is showing reduced content. So to summarize that, older adults are showing one, they're showing reduced within network connections. So most of the networks are becoming fuzzier, less tightly correlated, right? That was in both the default and dorsal tension. But interestingly, they're also showing um, a reduced anti-correlation, or an increased correlation. But it's actually a reduced anti-correlation between the default and dorsal tension. So that sort of ones up, the others down, seems to be coming fuzzier. There are now a bunch of, there are now several studies that have done sort of brain-wide looking at all the systems to show this is very consistent. Lots of networks starting to show reduced within network connections and increased across network connectivity. Finally, um, my colleagues, uh, Nate Spring and Gary Turner, came up with this idea of what they call the default executive coupling hypothesis of aging or DECA. And that is that it's not just about a broken default network that's stuck on, right, that doesn't suppress. Um, there's a whole study I can show you on that, but for gravity, I'll just stay with this. What you actually have is that these control regions, like especially these executive regions of the prefrontal cortex, remain correlated with the default network. So the default network is active, but it also seems to be constantly engaged in the control network. And what they showed was um, the extent to which different individuals showed that was correlated with how they did on that autobiographical memory test. Right? So this is um, connectivity between the default network and these control regions of the prefrontal cortex and how much external detail they provided on that autobiographical interview. So the stronger connection between the default and the control region, the more of that external detail they gave. And that correlation is the blue line is only in the older adults. We didn't see that in the younger adults. Okay, so that was like the second part. I know, I know it's almost the end of the hour, but we started kind of special. Should I keep going for a bit? Okay. I could rush through. All right, so that sort of brings us to Things we don't know. What I tried to present there was that it's kind of a chicken and egg scenario, right? Do we see that the default network is on all the time and, and engaged with the control network because older adults are relying on their semantic knowledge because that's what's intact, right? Or do they tend to rely on their semantic knowledge and, and get distracted and bring in external information all the time because the brain networks are out operating differently? This is, this is the crux of the thing we can We're not sure. So what are we going to do? Well, right now we're going to try and use all these techniques and modulate these things and suppress or enhance them and see what we can do about it. So quickly, this is sort of an alternative. I showed you that image about the person looking at letters and getting stimulation in the primary occipital cortex. I'm going to show some work. Um, initially, I went down to uh, the Beth Israel Deacon's Hospital in Boston to collaborate with Mike Bang and Mike Fox. But I discovered this other guy named Mark Alco down there uh, who did some of the seminal pioneering stuff on this, showing that if you localize these nodes on a network kind of a basis, and then you can actually target the individual subjects, you can affect activity across the whole network. So here's, this is just showing you the default network with functional connectivity, right? Notice that it also has nodes in the cerebellum, as do most of the other networks. That's interesting. There's lots to say about that. Delivering CMS to two different nodes of the default network, one appears in the anterior parietal lobule, or down here in the cerebellum, with different frequencies, resulted in three interesting effects. So in this case, a certain frequency is actually favor stimulation for anybody similar to us. Intermittent thing for stimulation. The first region result, resulted in not just local change in activity, but a decrease in the functional connectivity across these core regions of the default network, and quite specifically. Right? So you, you stimulate here, and what you get is these. Now remember, they stimulate these effects with about three to four minutes of stimulation. Effects can last up to 60 minutes. So you can stimulate offline, take some of the MRI scanner, and look at the effects for quite a lot. You can also do a behavioral test and see how it affects performance. Right, so this is a decrease in not just activity, but correlations among these regions. Stimulation down here at a different frequency resulted in an upregulation of the connectivity that 
Right? So there have been some pretty good demonstrations of these things now. And now we want to leverage this to go back and answer some, try and answer some of those questions we've been working on. Okay? So how are treating pressure? How are they actually using this? Remember resistor and one fluid for Kuku's nest? And I won't say a lot about ECT because I'm here at the Royal Hospital and most people who make it here might know a lot more about it than me. But um, I think this is about, you know, using electrical activity, causing a seizure, somehow kind of like a Windows reboot of the brain. I think that people who are really resistant or not responsive to multiple medications, severely depressed, this is sort of still the go-to in the gold standard. And it apparently it's quite effective. And my understanding is that it comes with fairly substantial side effects that are desirable, like memory loss, confusion, attention focus problems. And also, who the heck knows what it's doing. What about a more targeted intervention that has, we have, we have a sort of theoretical reason to think might work? Here are a few examples of what the TMS, the part of the dorsal prefrontal cortex, can do to activity in parts of the brain that are really heavily involved in depression. So this is subgenual, this is area of subgenual cingulate 25, kind of made famous by, I think, probably Helen Mayberg first, as being a critical part of the brain um, involved in emotional regulation and being out of whack in depression. Um, and I won't get into her whole model about, you know, CDT top-down effects and drug effects that are bottom up. But if you look at um, the effect of, let's see, this is 1 hertz TMS to the left of DPLFC, DLPFC here. Uh, what you wind up with there is um, changes in the bold signal, right, in that part of the brain. Here we've got um, 10 hertz um, TMS, and this is the effect on um, reduced dopamine release measured with PET afterwards, okay? Stimulation here also results in, um, let's see, it's, so that's going to be reduced dopamine release, sorry, I got that backwards. This was um, regional cerebral blood flow measurements are decreased in that. point is that on two PET measures and an MRI measure, when you stimulate this region, you get changes in activity in that subgenome. Okay. So using TNS um, is now an FDA approved treatment in the US, um, which means it's being done a lot, so we're health, health insurance. And some, you know, there's, there are mixed reports, and others you might know better than me, but uh, my understanding is that their success rates are fairly long-lasting, sometimes close to per maybe permanent um, benefits are on the order of what people are getting with ECT. So these are typically people, again, who have not responded to multiple medications. There we go, sorry. Now just quickly to point out here, um, there's that subgenual area of 25, and there's sort of the rest of the activity, right? Random fluctuations, spontaneous fluctuations over a bunch of time in scan. Now, if you look at stimulation to two different regions in the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex, you say how highly correlated was that, that spontaneous activity in this region or that region compared to that? And this region showed a much higher correlation. Okay? Well, the point here is that stimulation to this region had a much larger effect on reducing compression than stimulation to this region. So the idea is that we can actually use these the spontaneous or resting state activity, find something we're going after, and look for its partner on the cortical surface. We can, we can actually modulate that network and have an effect. Right? Without going with, you know, from, the, from the scalp. Um, sessions are usually you know, multiple, multiple days in a row for a week or something. Uh, and they're having long lasting effects. So I'm, almost, I'm getting close to the end. Sorry, I'm a little tired. So can we use this actually to go back and look at enhanced you know, brain function or cognition in nature? So this is the part where I say, when I built my CMS lab, um, I've never done it before. I had no idea what I was doing, but I, this is what I wanted to do. So I met good network, network of good collaborators, I got a good postdoc, and we've been working on this. And I'm going to show you this is brand new. The first, the first time we used our system was in December. We were collecting a couple of pilot subjects to try and make a grant application. So I'm going to show you data from one older adult and one younger adult. And I, don't, I, I think it's compelling that you can see pretty radical looking effects in individual subjects. We now have collected about six, six more of multiple multiple schools. So remembering that we've, you know, we've got this three network model here. Right? So we're, what I'm going to do now is to say, what happens if we try to suppress default network like activity? Could it be that this thing you know, is on and it's causing distraction and people have a problem with this picture description task? What if we suppress it? You know, what if we suppress that during memory? Are we going to find that people you know, just don't give any details? Um, or are they going to need to increase that side of detail because they're not distracted? There's a bunch of interesting hypotheses. I'm just going to show you one example. So, we're going to look at a young adult where we, for each individual adult, we've done a few now, we put them in a scanner, we actually localize their, their networks and find, find the core, the peak of the node right up there on the inferior fiber level. And with our neural navigation system, they're sitting in a chair in our CMS lab, I can look at a screen and see the brain and you can see exactly where you're sitting like, even down to the millimeter of the corpus. So you can be sure you're getting that spot on that individual. Right? 
here's what happened when we did this to Okay, so they're stimulated over here. So this is this is a uh, subtraction with the resting state. If I take a C here and say, what is the whole rate correlation with the set, that C look like before and after stimulation? Well, what you can see is that you've got increased functional conductivity across the default network. So it worked. This is a replication of what Mark Halko showed in one adult subject. What we didn't necessarily expect was there was a concomitant increase in connectivity in this region with control regions of the brain. So we actually localized two particular control regions. Um, so actually, the default network, the posterior right, this, um, this region here, and the PPC, the medial prefrontal cortex, from pre to post, the connectivity went down, we expected. But in these control regions, we actually saw what is a decrease in anti-correlation, right? So the, the negative correlation was, was decreased. So I think we're having effects, we know that these networks interact, so the, the effects are not specific just to the one network, but they're affecting the dynamics between them, which is really important. Now, when we actually first submitted a grant, these people had said, you have no idea what's going to happen in an older adult. There's cortical tree, you don't even know if you can hit the same nodes. What's going to happen? They have different dynamics in their networks. And it's true, we didn't know what to expect. So remember that, that we're calling this here. This is an image of that idea that that anti-correlation is disintegrated, right? So you refer to that as network level de-differentiation. What happened when we stimulated that node in this older individual here? Let's get the blue regions where we saw de decreased correlation. So we saw, we saw the reverse, basically. The default network showed an increase in, in, in connectivity. But this dorsal tension system, which should be anti-correlated, was anti-correlated now. So here's an example. Right, so from pre to post, we saw connectivity go up in the default network, which is opposite of the older adults. But here's what happened. They went from actually having a positive correlation between the default and dorsal tension when a young adult that's anti-correlated, right? It flips to an actual anti-correlation. So if you just look at these post bars, that looks more like what a healthy young adult brain is like. So we are calling it re-differentiating the younger brain. If we get a few more subjects to show this, we have a really good So I hope that's clear. I'm going to do that a little quickly. But we went from this de-differentiation where the anti-correlation is gone to increasing it. OK, the last little section is a, is a word on neural feedback training. If you can, can we do five more minutes? Yes. OK, thank you. Which is and I'm going to preface this with, I was an absolute skeptic. I had a great conversation today um, where I thought, this, this stuff's crazy. I mean, I believe it sounds neat. You know, I've seen a couple of little snippets and anecdotes, but really, can this work? This neurofeedback training. So this is the idea. It's a simple principle that the user can actually alter implicitly somehow, alter their brain activity if they receive immediate or timely feedback on the brain stage change. So you draw a circle and you know, draw neural lines in the brain and you want to get them to raise brain activity or neural fire in that region. Well, if you, if you tie the level of activity in that brain to some kind of visual display like a flame, right? And the more activity there, the bigger the fire gets. And you tell them, just make the fire big. Do with your brain. They'll say, I have no idea what you're talking about. But over time, it fluctuates. And almost everybody will supposedly implicitly learn how to make that thing become a place. They may not know exactly what they did, why, or how, but they learn. So in this situation, we're talking about the user has some kind of measuring device on the head, your EEG and headset. You get the EEG signals, you get the feed back to them somehow, and then that can have an effect on the brain. Right? So it works on operant condition. I will say that my understanding, so the reason I got involved with this is I had, um, there's a long time scientist I know who left science and she started, she, she started a company. She's a CEO and founder of a company. And they're developing this software engine to try and harness this and use it to improve cognition in older adults. I thought, no way am I getting involved with that. But she had funding, and then my tax came in and matched funding for a postdoc to do this for two years. I thought, OK, why not? We'll do it. All right, so looking at the literature, I think, I, no offense to anybody here might be doing neurofeedback training, but I thought the literature was generally a mess. All right, so there's some different studies that talk about aging and improving aging. Lots of them don't have any controls, and they have bad controls, or don't report statistics. And um, it seems sort of a suicide point. I just think, it's, I just think there's a lot of problems. Um, to be positive, I think there's a lot of work to be done. I think it's the frontier. There's lots of room for good work. So there's just a few examples. This one study caught the eye of my colleague, and this is why she gave up her job and, <laughs> and started. So quickly, I'll show you what they did. These people wanted to uptrain a particular brain frequency. And if you read the paper, their idea was that midline frontal theta on an EEG scan is, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a pretty good neural marker for engaging the control network, the cognitive control network. Right? So here's an old, a few older and younger adults. It is a baseline. They have a low level of this. You know, this is their midline frontal theta, with that electrode. 
Uh, and this is what it should look like post training. That's an example of some such transition. So what they did was they had people come into the lab, they had a, a good EEG system, and they either fed them feedback and they had with like, some kind of goal, visual feedback, that was tied to the, the power in their midline front of data, or they had a sham condition where they were fed feedback on, on an ever-changing random uh, frequency. So first, they showed that across these 12 training sessions, just 12 sessions, the black line is they would measure the beginning of the session, the midline front of data, and then what it was after they'd done the training. So you can see as they go through one or more sessions, they're able to you know, have a bigger differential from the start to the end of the training every time. That's in both uh, older and the young adults. Okay. And nicely, they had a big sham that showed no difference, right? So it wasn't just from participating in the thing or whatever. Here's the kicker. So some of this might harken back to the idea of these brain training games, you know, or Lumosity, and there's been a lot of controversy, right? Controversy, right? So, um, where, you know, people get, they make a lot of promises about this thing improving cognition. But what it tends to do is that you get really good at the thing you're training on, and there's not a lot of solid, consistent evidence, so they say, that it is this transferable or generalizable in a way that would make it useful. So the whole idea with this is that, you know, it's not worthwhile unless we can show it. So what these researchers also did was a small battery of tests on attention and memory before training, at the beginning, before the day training, and then at the end. Right? And they reported three post effects, which is hard to believe. It's not the best paper I've ever read, but it's pretty compelling. So they had measures of alerting, or three measures of attention. Alerting, which is your ability to be faster when you're alerted that something's coming up. Orienting is if you have a directional cue, how much faster you are to indicate where something's going to come up, just target detection. And conflict is if you get target detection but you've got conflicting information, how much that slows you down. And what they showed was only for the older adults, not the young, and only for the neural feedback chain, not the sham, they got improvements in all three measures of this tension. So they got faster and faster and they had less effect of the distraction. And then they had a couple memory measures. This is actually a uh, Sternberg memory task with Asian characters. So the young adults, so it's a uh, it's, uh, sham and neurofeedback training um, for young, sorry, young sham and neurofeedback training pretty close. So the young, basically the young adults can show, and either group showed no improvement, you know those third seal, right? So they did help regulate their midline frontal data, did do the memory task, not surprisingly. It also didn't help their attention, seemingly. Possibly because, I mean, one of the thoughts is that this is particularly important for older adults who are not engaging in cognitive control network in the same way. Here's what the older adults look like. So there's the sham, right? No difference between pre and post. Here's the neurofeedback for the old. Yeah. So they had a significant improvement pre and post to this memory task. And in fact, post, they're not that much, you know, they were significantly different from performing level of the young adults. That was their claim. So if you believe it, it's one study. It's not the best study ever done, but it's, at least it's rigorous and has a good control. It's kind of compelling. Question is, would that ever have any real significance? So that brings me almost to the end why I got involved with this industry partner. She wants to make a lot of money doing this with normal people walking around in the real world. Right? So that's not going to work if you have to have people come to the lab and get hooked up with something like that or much more complicated. But now, if you see people walking around these things, the news headsets, I've seen them in coffee shops and on, on the bus. It's basically kind of like a little majority of forest thing you're wearing your head. Um, there's a company in, in Toronto that developed it. But you get them for a couple hundred bucks in a lot of stores now. These things actually are a pretty good hardware. They measure EEG signals from a few electrodes. And they can wire, you know, it's mobile, and it wirelessly projects to your smartphone or your tablet. Right? So this is not unused. This is actually a presumably better piece of hardware from China that we can't get here, but my collaborator. That's what that thing looks like. So what they did was, could this thing work in the real world? So my collaborator is sends a lot. Um, they're developing a product. I'm just, I'm just the silent academic partner doing a double blind validation experiment. I don't make money for this, so you know, I don't have any conflict of interest here yet. Um, but I still, again, I, I was really skeptical. Just getting, so what, they, what, they, what this company's done is they developed this whole web portal and this software engine. Um, now people can wear these things, turn on their iPad at home, train, and all the information is uploaded in real time to the cloud and being analyzed. And you, can have, you can have research assistants at the lab watching people train, and it's really cool. Um, so people come into the lab, and they, we give them a whole battery of tests, standardized kinds of things, memory and attention, and some other tests. Uh, we teach them how to do the training, and then they go away, and they do, uh, for our study, we do 24 sessions. Okay. And we actually have been going into some retirement homes, and having people come down, they come down for different sessions and workshops, and so we do this. 
Okay, so I'm just, if you want, I can show you, I can skip this or show you what the actual software looks like. Does anybody want to see the demo or should I skip it over? Yeah. Sure, okay. It's, I'll show you. So this is actually, it's kind of nice. It's, um, this is an actual video footage of somebody riding through the mountains in Corsica. And the idea is just that you tell the person, make the bike go faster. So we don't have sound here, that's okay. Okay, we start by getting a base channel of people doing breathfuls and things, okay? And then, it starts. Let's give you 10 seconds. Sorry. Make the bike go faster. And they get frustrated because they can't figure it out. And usually, by the end of the first session, they're doing it. Right? So, when you get going faster, the music picks up, becomes more inspirational, the scenery gets nicer. Um, now, the app has things like little tokens that appear up here, and you have to grab your token. That's a measure of retention. Are you tending to these tokens that come up? At the end of the run, we test for memory. You know, which tokens did you get? Um, and where was it on the screen? So we can test is the memory improving in terms of spatial things? It's a little further along the road. And it goes on. Is it a VR or do you, do you have a Right now it's just it's literally on an iPad. Um, oh, you just. Oh, yeah, so they're, they're just looking at their iPad and when one of the actors comes up, they just touch it. Okay. And they gather these tokens and then you know, we can say, we can mix them with novel ones and say which one's the real recognition. And then we can ask them to drag it to where it came from and the source. The main thing, um, I'm not going to show it, is just, again, you know, older adults trying to figure out, these, these much older adults trying to figure out how to use Bluetooth, how to get a headset on without pick up in here and get a signal that's noisy. I had zero hopes for this project, and I had some, yeah, lots of difficulties, um, lots and lots of difficulties. But my postdoc, this is about a month ago, crunched our initial results. We're only partly through data collection. So we're, out, we're trying to get to 60 in the neurofeedback and 60 in the sham. You notice that we have very few shan people get frustrated and drop out when you're not getting better for 24 sessions. Now we tell them they could be in this in, in this flexibility condition where we're changing the networks and that they can then come back and do the real training after, but people slow up. But so far we've only got about half our sample from neural feedback and a very small sham. But first does it do anything? So what I'm going to show you here is a different measure. Instead of showing you the two lines like the last study, this is just going to be pre before they train to right after, is there a difference in the midline frontal theta? Again, these headsets, it's two little electrodes, it's very noisy, but it's working. So the blue line is neural feedback. So that's how much, you know, that difference is how much they ramp up before, before and after training. And there's the sham hovering around there. Sometimes they go down, probably because they're actually upregulating other networks. Right? Now, again, the sham's pretty noisy because there's only 17 subjects. But we definitely, there's this little difference there. This is what got me. I did not expect to see behavioral improvements yet. So we did similar, three measures of attention. So alerting, orienting, and conflict. So the red lines are the sham, and the blue lines are the neural feedback training, and we've got three posts. So we had statistically significant, we were not with our 38 or however many subjects it was, in all three of them. And we had no effects in the sham. Now we don't yet have the significant interaction here, part of that's because we only have 17 sham. But they're flat, I don't think adding more of them is going to make them all sudden put term burden. So I, it seems to be working. Much to my shock. We also had a memory, so we did a verbal fluency measure and a working memory measure, which was an NDAP test. You see that? Okay, so first, what do we see? Well, here's the neural feedback chain, and here's the sham. Pre to post, right? Well, they both get a little better. That's practice effects. You're going to get better on a verbal fluency test. I should say that people came into the lab and did the tests. They had 24 sessions of training. We wanted them to train twice a day if possible. So most of them took about two weeks at home and then came back to the lab within the following week. So these, these post-assessment measures are from before training started to somewhere within a week after they finished training. And what you see here is a significant improvement in, in verbal fluency in the neural feedback group, and that was a significant interaction. And here was the working memory in that task. Same thing. Neural feedback training got better, and it was a significant interaction. So, that's it. <laughs> I'm surprised. I didn't want to get into it. But it's, now there's a whole lot more questions than anything else.
Uh, so I'm just going to wrap up with uh, a gratuitous shot of my kid. Like he would <laughs> say that we, I feel like a kid who basically, you know, talking about three networks, I know the brain is a lot more complicated. And it's hard to figure out. But sometimes simple works. You should get the lobes there. Yeah, I'll say thanks and acknowledgements. So um, a lot of work is kind of relies on my colleagues at the Barrett's Analysis Center at that Israel Deaconess in Boston. So my pleasure to mark this up to Toronto all the time and also get the two going. And that's my issue for the Central Labs. And that's it. So sorry for going over long, but thank you. Time <laughs> around if you want to take questions. Yeah. Do you um, do you have any sense of Enduring the changes are with the neurofeedback? Has there been any study in the future? I mean, if you don't continue to do neurofeedback, what happens to the effect? That's the question. So that's what we're trying to do right now. So right now we're trying to review small one. So for one, just follow up with some of these participants because we've got a nice big group of them. We're actually, I think by the end of April, we should get up to 60 in both groups. And so hopefully, unless something radically changes, we'll be writing a paper on this. I would like to follow up some of them. I'd also like to see, we also want to run a study where you have people training for a lot longer and looking at the progression. What I can say is that um, it's lasting for days to a week. Um, and these are again, tasks that are completely unrelated to what people are doing, right? Making the bike go faster. Um, I, mean, even if, I would be encouraged even if they didn't really last and the older adults are happy to do this training as often as possible and you know, up their day-to-day -day memory and attention to me. If it's true. I'm still, I'm still a bit of a skeptic on this. Uh, so, but for the neurofeedback, what about expectation or placebo effects? You have a sham control group, but they dropped out because they can tell them it's happening. So, do you have any measure of people's expectation of coming into it, or their, you know, their assessment of how much they would be helped? Yeah. So we're doing as much as we can. I mean, we had, we had 100 decision points that we agonized over, right? For the sham condition. So people can they get a random frequency that's actually feeding back, right? We also talk about what about what about actually giving them actually feedback from someone else's session who's training. So they're actually getting the reward and getting faster. Maybe that's enough, right? Maybe it's just being engaged and feeling reward for engaging. I mean, this is you know, it's in its infancy. Um, yeah, and it's a problem. Just, you know, we, 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 we try to cast this idea that you're in the sham condition, maybe like saying, we're gonna be switching, you know, we explain what's happening, say we're switching this. It's flexibility. You flexibly alternate. And, you know, it'll be harder to get faster, but we're going to give you the training at the end. You know? And some have stuck around, but um, we've lost some. Yeah, this, this is fraught with all kinds of methodological difficulties, for sure. And lots of follow-up studies to be done. But it could just be people buying it in the, in the actual NFT condition. People were buying it and saying, oh, I think this is working. This is making me better. And that's, that's what's making you better. Happening. Why would that happen? Then, but why would that happen in the neurofeedback training group? Not the oh, so you're saying they are actually out training? So we buy that they're, that they're actually increasing and are getting appropriate feedback, but that's just the experience of succeeding and being and being committed. Yeah, absolutely. So what we that was another thing we talked about. What about training different groups on different frequencies? Mm -hmm. And then we realized we better find out what we're doing with people if we have trained some other frequency and we're making them. You know, you're right. There's the, we, we went with this, but it's, it's not sufficient. It needs a lot. We need to do a lot more comparisons and control conditions for sure. So, because the that data signal is related to things like motivation and uh, focus too, to some extent, is it not? Yeah, I mean, yeah. I, mean, I, I would like to do with MRI. Which is, there's, there's an incredible study from a lab, my old lab at NIMH that I left a few years ago. Where they had they took uh, typically developing and autistic uh, youth, uh, young adults, and they were given neurofeedback training based on some idea that it has to do with disconnection between the neural nodes. They had a brain paper that pretty strongly showed it's sort of disconnection. And rather than giving them feedback on just amplitude activity, they were giving them feedback based on correlated signal between these two regions, trying to boost connections between them. And they got they they found that the groups were all boosting connections between them. And then the autistic, in the autistic participant group, the degree to which they increased that was correlated with improvement of symptoms. This guy published me life, which is a pretty good record of the journal. I still, I guess, it sounds like science fiction to me. Um, I would say, yeah, so then, you know, you read the paper, why midline frontal theta? It's, you know, there's some justification, there's some indication that maybe you can kind of reverse inference whatever story you want. I don't know. 
we need to do more to really be confident in what we think it is. Back to the part of yeah, I just wanted to make a couple points. I'll preface it by saying that I'm a neurofeedback therapist. I've done ah. about five years in a clinic, a medical <laughs> clinic, and I was done lots of EEG research and, and brain stimulation stuff. So very fluent in the topic. Uh, to answer your question, from earlier, there are definitely some studies that show very long-term lasting effects from things like neurofeedback. I actually do it in autistic patients as well as like brain injury patients. Uh, not as much in aging, but we've seen it in kids. My primary spots over at CHEO. But what I wanted to say is that there, there's also some ethical considerations, like you said. When you want to talk about using a, a random frequency for a sham condition, you're up training or down training something that can have an implication for that person's brain health. And uh, that's something that should be considered. Most sham conditions these days for neurofeedback will use no actual training, but they'll just use a video, like you said, wow. of what happened during someone else's session. So they think yeah. something's happening, but they're not getting it. So that way you eliminate any actual brain-based effects. And that, uh, I published a paper that literally was, uh, I think about a week and a half ago, in uh, neuroscience uh, communication notes about using wireless uh, commercial grade EEG systems and how their results aren't replicable using um, uh, medical grade EEG. That was not with this like high tech Chinese device. I personally never evaluated that device, obviously. So maybe it, it has some advantages that we didn't use in the emotive device in the study. Yeah. But all those are definitely little things to consider. All this is, I, I totally think neurofeedback is a wonderful option. And it definitely seems, based on the, the graphs issue, it seems very successful uh, so far. But I, I would still be a little skeptical based on the consumer grade of the device for one thing, and the at-home use, and it is still clinically available, and people can, there's three clinics just in Ottawa that do neurofeedback therapy within 15 minutes from where we are right now. So, I mean, you can do it uh, with medical grade technology and with proper training, without training frequencies that you're not aware of. And you also made a comment, sorry I'm, I'm talking a long way. No, I, I um, say this is good value information. Earlier you made a comment too. And this is just like based on something that Norman Deutsch said a long time ago, he was one of the like, famous you know, pioneers in neurofeedback. That like anybody who hopes to get rich off of neurofeedback or become a millionaire off of neurofeedback should start it as a billionaire. Uh, <laughs> because they're not going to. Um, which I, it sucks. I think it's a great technology and I, the, what you're doing is actually the best step forward, I think, is to make it more available widely like that. So it's totally the right direction, but little things that maybe we could tweak to. Yeah, it would be good to connect because I, I, I would absolutely acknowledge that I'm naive, if not ignorant. <laughs> this is a whole new sort of branch, and I'm just starting to get speed. Um, I mean, but, more than I have to check. Yeah, no, it would be great. And you know, the way, you know, running it the best we could, and just getting what looks like solid results. And again, we need bigger numbers. That sharing group is flat. I don't think it's going to change in so many years. So, but thanks for the input. I, I know there's a lot more to figure out here, and mm -hmm. really big with this. And I'm not getting rich off this in my books. So. <laughs> yes. Um, I was wondering. Uh, this is sort of a naive question. When I was in Montreal and my postdoc a few years ago, um, there was uh, one of the labs was really trying to push forward um, real-time fMRI and mm -hmm. all of these sorts of lines modulate brain activity, but more of the time scale. Old activity sort of like akin to neurofeedback. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if you had this had this has led you down towards that direction with your time around right? Because you don't see a lot on the topic. No, I'm thinking about that that's actually why I brought up that, that autism study, which that's what that was that was actually uh, real time old FMRI feedback. But again not not just sort of based on amplitude in a particular region, but based on um, a running a running average of how correlated the activity was between these two nodes. And they reported getting an increase in synchrony between these regions and then a later correlation of that with symptoms. So um, do I want to do it? I don't know. <laughs> I got a lot going on. It's a good idea for somebody. There's a, a nice study by uh, Patrick Fuelmer's lab from the University of Geneva. I did a fellowship there with Dr. Thomas Ross and they did a lot of fMRI-based neurofeedback work, and some of it's actually in collaboration with the uh, University of Western Ontario. 
And uh, I think there's some of the, the best stuff that they have as far as the fMRI, you know, mostly in PTSD patients. It's a good lab. It's a good, yeah. good, there's a lot of good work. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, I'm, I'm not familiar enough with all of it. So, so it's, kind of, it's kind of intimidating to just bring it here and present it. I thought, why not? Yeah. Uh, I have two quick comments. As a neuroscientist, I really appreciated your presentation and the way you told your story, and it's uh, really nice data. But as a clinician, I can actually offended by the picture you chose to illustrate ECT. Okay. It would be like trying to say neurosurgery, and instead of showing a nice modern operating room, you show somebody putting an eye stick through the orbits to do a frontal anatomy. So please use something that is less stigmatizing. No, oh, certainly. Yeah, my apologies. Like, I, mean, I probably didn't I probably didn't present that the way it was meant because I actually do use the ice pick uh, surgery pictures as well. Um, you know, it's an undergrad teaching and talks, but only yeah, only to, to, to the argument is actually that it's come a long way. And what I should have had probably, you know, I understand what you're saying. I, I point well taken. I have to take that up. And it certainly wasn't meant to um, be a condemnation of the of the method. Yes. I have a question about your ITMS and differentiation results. Yeah. So if I understood well, like it reduced the differentiation of these large networks. But I mean, I guess my question is, I do research in uh, with face recognition, you know, yeah. as well as large so Would you expect the, because we, we see the differentiation with the modularity of face perception? Would you expect that the TMS would produce similar results if you? I guess because it also networks, so if you um, that's a really good question. So, I mean, for example, one one thing that we're doing, which I didn't get into at all, is I'm really interested in um, the visual word form area, which is kind of controversial. You can't get at that with TMS, but you know, it's, it's, a, it's a, one of these regions that acts like a category-specific region, like like the FFA, PPA, or these other sort of function-specific or preferential regions. But we also know that it could have evolved. You know, um, it, it, has to, it only comes about when one learns to read. And so um, we're actually um, seeing that really with a finding it's, well, I, I published a paper in the Journal of Neuroscience last year showing the, the strength of connection between that visual word from which is ventral visual, and Bernicke's area, localized, um, is correlated with people's reading ability skill. So we're actually going to do a team study where we're trying to affect the connectivity of it. Um, you can't get something like the FFA. Um, you can't stimulate the FFA. People have done OFA stimulation. And if you localize it and do it right, you actually get changes in, say, these parameters. So, but I guess the question would be, do, you, do I think that you could have an effect that would be similar in where, where you actually sort of reverse or increase, reverse the de-differentiation or re-differentiate? I don't know. This just this was one subject, one older subject. Not sure you I mean, this was the first older subject we did. Um, and those are pretty whopping. In fact, like, this correlation changes were changed to the point two. Too. I think maybe, I don't know. But I guess it depends on exactly what you're trying to do. Would you need, um, yeah, I'm not sure. It's well, I guess in theory, some of these, this the differentiation leads to functional problems. Um, yeah, I mean, that's. So if you could, you know, it's, it's obviously not a very practical solution, but uh, it would be interesting as, as also yeah. a critical question. Yeah, I've seen that. Like, if you just look at sort of the, yeah, the specificity of a whole bunch of category regions, it tends to decrease, right? It tends to be exactly. one. Yeah. Um, in these parts, it's a good one. There's several. Yeah. I don't know. It's a good question. I have a comment. I have a question. The comment is that it looks like uh, single and C's might also have theory of mind. So it's not uniquely human. Uh, yeah, that's a good debate to have. Yeah. <laughs> but there are some evidence that. The reason why we don't think that animals have theory of mind is that it's very hard to test in them because we can't ask. Uh, the question is how long how long do you rest to stay to scan and how uh, how much after the TMS to do it in the in the study? Yeah, so in the one that the one I showed the data yeah. we're doing right now. So I love that. So we just we just got um, a brand new upgrade to our scanner, so which is awesome. We now have a Prisma fit. And it does multi-band, we're doing multi-echo if you know any of state data, it's a way of processing the data that's really good for eliminating all kinds of other confounding noise signals. I think it's the state of the art the best. Um, so we can do multi-band, multi-echo, 
So pretty high resolution with a TR of about 0.5 to 1 second. Um, so we're, a lot of it is not just how long, you need to be long enough scan because you're looking at little frequency signals. It's more about the number of measurements, right? And temporal resolution is important. So you can you know, not be able to use higher frequency things into your low frequency data. So we have, so we, we use multi-band, multi-echo. I think that a TR is less than, a little less than a second. And we're scanning for 12 minutes. Um, and so we have people, uh, we scan people on day one um, with some task-based and rest. We can localize, net, we can cross-reference their network nodes based on the resting connectivity and activation, deactivation during a task. We load that into our neural navigation system. We bring them back on another day. And when they're sitting in a chair, we can register that to their head and we can stimulate that region. So with the intermittent theta burst stimulation, I think it's three and a half minutes stimulation. Um, we get them up, take them to the scanner. We measured that with our first five participants, and it's an average six to seven minutes. There's actually a paper that argues that's the peak of the effect around that time. And that the half-life might be something like 40 minutes, but you have pretty solid effects to 60 minutes. So we have them in the scanner by seven minutes, scan for 12 minutes, take them right out of the behavioral test. And they're done in less than, less than 30, or 35, 40. So we, we have a similar Study starting, but we, we have a third, we're planning to have a 30 minute delay. So it sounds like we might still see something interesting to the law. Are you using, do you, what, yeah, this gets down to like, do you have what kind of power frequency? Is you, are you using like a, like a max and super plus two or something? Or like, you know, it's just that, like, if you got, if you got, if you got the data versus pulse with enough power, um, it looks like you probably, you know, so I'm going to see if you get past 60 minutes. Again, whenever, whenever I submit something or do a talk, you, you get different opinions on this. I think they're using more. A lot of people are doing the validation work and just doing studies, like you know, titrating and looking at timing things. But um, more needs to be done. And we're just, we just got you know, our first few subjects here. But I mean, that was compelling. I mean, you know, and it wasn't like a, that. To somebody looking at that image, I put might look like a scatter plot, a bunch of regions, and you're reading the twos. Those are the networks, OK? Like, it's almost completely knows the networks and almost nothing else. It's really, and, and you know, individual subjects, correlation changes at point two, it's pretty compelling. So I think, you, I think you're fine, 30 minutes. Can I just follow up on, the, on this task about site selection? So, mm -hmm. yep, people come in, you scan them, at rest, they do a task or whatever. Yep. You have to use neural navigation because your nodes are all very close to each other, like interspersed with one another. Yep. Some places in the brain, like maybe frontal and parietal zones, but you know, when you use um, stimulation for depression, use TMS or uh, yep. uh, for depression, people just find a general site that they can hit that's probably going to work for most people. Are there zones where you could do that? So it looks like the default network. Um, you're going to get much more temporal, like lateral, uh, temporal, experimental, um, temporal gyrus activation. And the other two networks, there's not a lot going on there. So why not go in there? So yeah, if you wanted to, or if you wanted to, um, or were compelled to, you know, um, funding and other resource related reasons, could you pick spots in the brain where you think, yeah, it's very likely that I'm hitting one of the three here yeah. in everybody, and one of uh, the three here, uh, another one of the three in everybody. This was, we, again, we agonized and debated for doing all this. It seems like the better how to way to, uh, to do it, definitely. But. So one thing, a couple of comments. So first, um, again, coming into this new, I decided I was going to go to the training session they have at what I think is one of the best, one of the a really good institutes, which is the, the Parents Analysis Center at Beth Israel Deaconess Harvard Med School, run by Alvaro Pascal Leon, and they're here. That's from my five years ago. Um, so they have a training course, it's a week long. I've, I've mentioned this to somebody, we went down there, and I think it was the best training course I've ever taken. It's 5,000 bucks, so it was really, really good. Um, so you're doing all kinds of hands on, doing everything. I'm talking to people there, and they, they pioneered some of this stuff, and they're doing, they're doing a ton of clinical, they're actually doing a ton of clinical work through there. Um, so, for example, Mark, my collaborator would argue that because of the way the FDA re regulations are, they're so specific about the protocol and what you have to do. And this treatment depression protocol is absolutely not optimal. Like, not, not optimal, but you're trying to maximize the likelihood of hitting, assuming that this works because we're hitting a node that is 
negatively connected subgenual CO25, which is a theory of just that and stuff. Um, you're likely to hit it pretty well in about a third of the people. And it, it, it based on like vertex measuring its angle and distance. Um, now, could you do better? Yeah, is you, you can do way better. But can we also then can we get rid of an MRI and localize it back on the back? There are practical considerations, but um, the complaint I've heard is that they could do a lot better, but the same is FDA approved for a certain protocol and that's what you have to do, and it's not all most of the time. So it's supposed to be, yeah, that what you're suggesting, you're likely to hit that. Um, now you might and you might know better than me if you're doing this stuff clinically. I was just going to make a comment about what it's like in Canada a little bit. Uh, I did my Princeton training at Princeton Health Center as well, oh, okay. uh, with Alberto and Pregni and those yeah. fellows. Uh, but when I was with Jonathan Downer from Toronto, he's got the TMS clinic there, uh, and it kind of toward what you're saying a little bit. We do follow essentially the same as the FDA guideline, but because it's not accepted in Ontario or covered by Health Canada, it's still an off-label treatment technically. And in their clinic, they'll actually zap a, a few, I don't like to say zap, so I shouldn't do that actually, but they, uh, they'll do a few regions sometimes. If there's one region that's maximally effective, they'll, they'll use it, but they can, they'll actually try multiple regions. And sometimes so they'll move around. Try, yeah, and sometimes uh, in the same person even, you might stimulate several regions in order to maximize the effect. And the same scene with like other types of brain stimulation, just doing like multi nodes. And uh, they'll use different TMS biomarkers, like the, the, the short intercortical uh, intervals. And based on these, they can determine sort of like which of those, say, three regions might be optimal for this person, yeah. which I think is a, it's a cool, slight advantage of the Canadian clinic, except we don't get reimbursed for it, which is definitely right. a disadvantage. That's true. So, I mean, yeah. So, I mean, they, they, they do all kinds of stuff. That's what Mike Clever is saying. Like, they can do a lot better, but when they're treating someone who's covered with insurance, they're, they're not getting out of treatment. Um, the treatment. I didn't So, we were trying to pick right. So, I didn't tell you the whole story here. What we're doing is we're bringing people in. First, we bring them in and they go in our MRI simulator and make sure they're going to be a good person. We give them a little TMS to make sure they can tolerate it and do the task. Then they come in another day and we do a localizer scan. We talk about how we localize. Then they come in for four sessions weekly after that where they get um, a scan of behavior, TMS, the pre and post. And so we're doing two frequencies to the IPL, one that's supposed to increase the effectiveness and one that decreases it, and two frequencies to another site. So we have two sites, two frequencies. It's a really, really ambitious study. Um, and we decided to go with the, we, wanted to, we wanted to do the dorsal attention system and default. So we went for the frontal eye fixes. There's a ton of research on the LPFC, and a lot of people are stimulating this thing. The first part, second person we got in there, we localized the, the, the frontal eye field and realized that it was pretty much enveloped by default kind of regions, so we couldn't get at it. So. And then sometimes some people, and I thought it was a bad region because it's down in the sulcus. That's a lot harder, you know, not only is it a deeper and harder, you're probably not getting the same kind of stimulation, it also has to do with the orientation of the axons, and there's all that, and it's just sort of a business messing in that sense. But with neural navigation, at least, I mean, the, the resolution and accuracy of the neural navigation system is beyond the resolution and accuracy of the coils, which are still pretty good. So it's cool. I mean, you can, you're looking at the screen, you can peel the skull off, and you can peel down the, the depth you want in the, in the gray matter and see right where the nexus of your, the peak of your factor is. It's pretty, it's pretty cool. But it's expensive and requires an array. Great. Right. Thank you very much for sticking around.